Hello and welcome to Heidegger 939. Let's see here. It's still quite warm here, even in the afternoon, and uh, I will continue with the path taken in the previous lecture about Susie Frobel. I take her to be most interesting and uh, revealing in most cases and uh, the area she goes into is an area that has not been ventured by anyone before her and that is how time works in a fractal sense uh, not disclosed by any scientist until that very point it has been spoken about uh, in a philosophical manner by Hassel and Henri Bergson, but to this depth I have not seen before, and this is of course one of those reasons, one of the reasons why it gets so interesting. Let me go into the text here a little bit, I need some more light I think actually. The light is coming from behind me it feels like. I didn't actually think about that. I might have to change this position. I do hope you can see me a little bit better now. Let's continue with Susie Frobel. Uh, I have gone into page 400. 48, 48 of the book Fractal Time. What? Why you watch? Why you watch Cat and Never Boils? And I ventured into simultaneity, which is incredibly important, and what that actually is when you start to take a closer look not just using the word or the concept in an almost academic way but instead looking what is simultaneity exactly and that can only do be done for an, of can only be done from a subjective path it cannot be done in a general objectified path it is way too complicated for that to be possible and it's the degree of complication that makes it impossible to do it by being object objective. Objectivity in the common sense is a simplification of everything and it can be recognized as a simplification and it always carries the traits of polarity. So it's a different quality to objective reality in the classical physical sense. It is really not the same thing. Let me continue. But there are other con constraints on simultaneity, both physical and psychological, which we encounter in our everyday lives on the planet Earth. When we synchronize various sets of multi-layered events in our now, one constraint is an external one, which is, the, which is linked to the fact that certain signals which reach us propagate at different speeds. If the thunderstorm is sufficiently far away from us, we first see the lightning and then we hear the thunder, because light propagates faster than sound. Another constraint, an internal one, is determined by the temporal threshold beyond which we perceive two success, successive events as one because the interval is too short for our perceptual apparatus to differentiate. We perceive auditory signals as non-simultaneous, that is to say as successive, as successive if they are separated by an interval of approximately 6 milliseconds. Below that threshold we perceive them as being simultaneous, 
tactile impressions merge into one event at the threshold of roughly 10 milliseconds. Visual impressions, on the other hand, are perceived as simultaneous if they are separated by an interval of 20 to 30 milliseconds. So if we experience sound, vision and touch at the same time, we may say that we experience sound, vision and touch at the same time. We may say that we are dealing with three nested simultaneous perspe perceptions. The auditory perception is nested into the tactile, which in turn is nested into the more extent visual. And here it could be a good point to remind the viewers and the listeners that uh, three dimensionality or depth is learned by the baby by tactile sensation. And uh, if you think about it more closely, it becomes obvious. But this is usually one of those things we forget as adults. The history of uh, how sensual perception come, come to us, it's not as obvious as we first think. Oversimplification is what we battle more or less. We are way too used to an oversimplified world where nothing is complex, nothing is ambiguous and everything is black and white, everything is so completely easy. That sort of world doesn't make for any swift decisions, it makes, doesn't make for any direction. It actually makes for an internal indecisiveness. And that is Sweden in a nutshell, I would say. People seem to be so stern and self-confident in their views and then they change it the very next time. It is very typical for Sweden. I would say but I would say these traits you can find all over the world in different de degrees but there is a similarity in not being able to take action and being too self-certain having a too less of a complex world uh, I'll be darned if you can find a championship athlete that has that simplified world he needs to act in the world. He cannot just make polarities and hate something, some tendency, some ideology or something else. That never ever leads to action. It is a deadening and it's an absolutely naive worldview because it's so simple it is beyond belief. And I would say that is one of the things that often surprised uh, people from Asia how adults actually had less of a complexity in their worldview than their children. And this is this digression or descent into oversimplifications. Oversimplification never seem real to anyone. The word speaks for themselves. And somebody talks who has experience. And that experience is internal as well as external. You can hear the truth of it. You don't need a reference, you don't need a proof. There is no, nothing to discern something that is good for you, something that is bad for you. You don't need these stupefied rules of factoids or fake news or anything like that. That is sheer uh, bread for the common people. Cannot access fractality. The incongruence we get here is smoothed out by another corrective distortion we perpetually perform without noticing. Although we react to acoustic stimuli faster than visual ones, our brains integrate the various sensory inputs into one gestalt. The German neuroscientist and psychologist Ernst Puppel defines a simultaneity horizon which spans at a radius of approximately 10 meters from the observer. At this distance we perceive audio and visual stimuli as being simultaneous. This is because the difference in the speed of light and sound is compensated by the difference in our reaction time to visual and acoustic stimuli. Within the simultaneity horizon we perceive acoustic stimuli before visual ones. Beyond it, visual stimuli reach us before acoustic ones. 
American neuroscientist David Eagleman, who specializes in the field of time perception, particularly in the distortion of duration and temporal order, also looks at how the brain synchronizes multi-layered, multi-model incoming signals. Like purple, he shows that the brain takes account of speed disparities among within its sensory channels when it tries to construct a coherent world by waiting for the slowest information to arrive. Then, within that window of delay, it makes sense of the gathered data in retrospect, or as Eggman puts it, post-didictively. An example of how the brain coordinates incoming multimodal signals is the firing of a gun to the start of a race. A spectator close to starting line sees the firing and hears the bang simultaneously, although vision and hearing process information at different speeds. The corrective distortions our brain performs to create unified sensory perception uh, of the world are remarkable. Just as we create size constancy, an example of feature binding, i.e. our ability to recognize objects under varying conditions by means of corrective distortions. Or so do we perform temporal binding when we assign a certain order and a duration to perceptions. For instance, if you touch your nose and toe at the same time, you feel the touch is simultaneous, although the signal from your nose reaches your brain faster than from your toe. We should take a detailed look at the synchronization of perceptions and temporal binding in chapter 6. As we saw in the sample of the shepherd scale, non-nested hearing is an acquired skill, resisting contextualization in order to avoid hearing the auditory illusion requires practice and a little help in form of emphasizing each be uh, beginning of the periodic signal. As adults, we have learned the con to contextualize, so nested hearings Hearing seems to be our normal mode of perception. However, it turns out that the skill of nesting our perceptions, even or of one mode, is also an innate skill. Not an innate skill, but an acquired one. Christian Chinkel, an Austrian musicologist and composer, recalls how he used to listen to his parents 45 rounds per minute single record which seemed to contain the same piece. Richard Kleiderman ballad pour Adeline in, on both sides. <laughs> Approximately at the age of four, I often compare the A and B sides without being able to make any kind of difference concerning the music as other single records contain different songs. I rated this as a pure waste of space. Only a few years later did I realize that one side contained a version for solo piano and the other version for an orchestral accompaniment. This example shows that as children, many of our perceptional performances are still very limited and we thus establish a completely different world. This is a quote from Christian Chinkel. Very interesting, actually. Nested hearing, that is to say, the perception of multi-layered signals of various extensions, is also an acquired skill. Like all contextualizations and corrective distortions, our brain has learned to perform. The resulting increase is available conceptualization has been described by development psychologist H. H. Clark in terms of the learning child's continuous acquisition of rules of application. Through interacting with the world, a child acquires a large number of new lots. Often, however, 
he will find himself confronted with a situation which he cannot comprehend by means of matter force already at his disposal. In such cases he would either not respond or try to use matter force he is already familiar with. Clark cites the example of a small boy who when looking at the picture book was asked when did the boy jump the fence? Pointed to the fence in the picture, he answered, there. That is, the boy had chosen to apply a special metaphor familiar to him, rather than a temporal one, which he has not yet mastered. So we see here that the spatial and the temporal intricacies are learned ones, and they are incredibly different from person to person. And one of the decisions that preemptively exist in the Western Hemisphere is to stop learning and that learning curve stops somewhere in the beginning of adolescence among Western children whereas it progresses exponentially actually uh, already at the end of the 20s in Asian men and women. The difference is staggering and this is also accounts for what I mentioned earlier on that we lose perception, we lose experience as we grow older in the West. But this is definitely not the case in the East, where the growing is progressive and getting bigger and bigger. Nested hearing, that is to say, the perception of multi-layered signals of various extensions is also an acquired skill, like all contextualization and corrective distortions our brain has learned to perform. I think here in this sentence we also need to notice that it's a movement procedure. We understand this contextualization and distortion signals by our bodily movement, and that is exceptionally different beings. This is why we cannot say one word for everyone. The accession or the acquirement of realizing what the word is is extraordinarily different. Uh, Susie Froebel mentioned that Mount chapter could be the scale of one to a thousand. That Some people have a thousand more experiential and experience-like feature in their reality, whereas others only have a very very thin shield of reality. So this talk about one dimensional, two dimensional experience, it is not an exaggeration. In reality with fractality we learn that experience and the access to greater reality that is shared by others is very very different from person to person. And especially if you don't train it, it becomes lower and lower. Building on such observation, I continue here with H. H. Clark. Clark formulates the complexity hypothesis, which is based on the correlation between human levels of perception and the appropriate language levels. It states that the order in which spatial concepts are acquired is imposed by rules of application, which include direction, point of reference and dimension. If two terms A and B, B require all the rules of application, A requires plus an additional one, then A is acquired before B. I think that is something one need to ponder into. An example is the order in which the proposition in, into and out of are acquired. In presupposes a three dimensional space. In to presuppose a three dimensional space and a positive direction. That is to say, in the direction of the stronger perceptual field. Out of presuppose a three dimensional space, a positive direction, and a negation of this direction. So we, we acquire first in, then into, and finally out of. Since the second and the third presuppositions, prepositions each require all the rules of application of the preceding ones, plus one in addition. 
The complexity hypothesis predicts for spatial and temporal terms the following order of acquisition. In antonymous pairs, the positive term will be learned before the negative one, e.g. into before out of. At on in are acquired before to on to and in to, because the latter requires an additional direction. Location prepositions such as at, on, in are mastered before correlative location prepositions such as above, in front of, as the latter require a point of reference in addition. Tall and short will be learned before thick and thin because the latter requires an additional dimension. Unmarked neutral terms which lack connotation will be acquired before marked neutral terms loaded with usually negative connotation. Positive terms are acquired before the negative opposites with the positive term determining the dimension. Long plus short minus is the dimension length. Every additional rule of application adds another layer. That is to say another lot New lots provide a new context by adding, for instance, a direction or a connotation, which make the term more complex. As this form of complexity retains the earlier required simpler terms, we can say that the simpler terms are nested in more complex ones, a fractal arrangement. Against the background of a fractal temporal perspective, learning is a result of generating new rules of application in the form of LODs. By contextualizing these LODs with every new experience or recollection, we continue to nest them into a cascade of LODs, which each time leads to a further increase in the delta T, depth in the now, with a capital M. I really like this now. Neologism, it does the trick. This has an effect on our perception of time. When we have generated a large number of lots, we are in position to arrange events in nestings, i.e. enduring relations rather than having to successively arrange them. Like beads on a string, on one lot, this could explain why a summer of one's childhood is so incomparably much longer than the summer of one's adulthood. I will come to more reasons for this later on. It also has to do with the lack of skill of dwelling into time, which makes for a time that is uh, proliferate in sameness. And sameness obscures the fractality of each moment. And this is what we used to experience when we were younger. Uh, an incredible depth and fractality and experience. And that was also the period where we learned the most. Learning has then gone down. And I would say after you are 14 or 15, it goes back and de learn so to speak. It's a combination of what the education system does and what you yourself infer from world, that they, it's the reality that tricks you, not your own thinking in the end. The act of recollecting may be regarding as learning too, as nesting means arranging past events in a new context. Such nestings by recollection often occurs in clusters, when a number of people discuss past events they remember. Examples of typical recollections clusters compromise class reunions, weddings, anniversaries, housewarming parties, and family slide shows on Christmas Eve. Think of a class reunion where recollections continue to be nested and rearranged, as all stories are discussed, corrected, and retold by the former classmates. As a result of this continuous increase of simultaneity, delta T depth increases perpetually and delta T length, by contrast, contracts steadily. For the former classmates, time flies. For the pitiable accompanying husbands and wives, 
delta t legs increases steadily as they cannot join in the recollecting and have to arrange every more and or less in cipher remark of the former classmates on a constant numbers of lots in other words they are more stiff I have described this familiar phenomena of subjectively varying perceptions of duration in chapter 2 and suggest that the distribution of delta t depth and delta t length accounts for temporal dilations and or contractions. Both these measures plus the resulting fractal dimensions are measures for comparing the temporal complexity of processes. When we use the notion of complexity we usually have some vague idea of what we mean by it. In everyday language we may, we may equate complexity with complicatedness. However, it's worth taking a closer look at this concept, since it reveals possibly unreflected assumption we maintain about absolute and relative order. In H. H. Clark's hypothesis, uh, the notion of complexity refers to both the degree of difficulty of applying rules as well as, as well as the intrinsically complicated structure of those rules themselves. There are at least as many senses of the word complexity as there are human faculties, some related to the level of internal organization of the structure, others to the difficulty of describing or constructing a, construction, a structure. Some measures of complexity are, at first sight, defined by the intrinsic organization. Algorithmic complexity in such a case. It uses the length of most compact descriptions of an object as a measure of complexity. If we compare the two strings, xx, y, xx, y, xx, y, xx, y, xx, y, xx, y, and l, q, h, s, i, h, g, u, b, v, a, p, k, z, y. The first one seems to be less complex because we can formalize this as a simple generation rule. The second string cannot be compressed, so its shorter description is the string itself, which means it's, it is random. John Casti describes the algorithmic complexity of an object as directly proportional to length of the shortest possible description of that object. He further observes that a string of letters is random if there is no rule for generating whose statement is appreciably shorter, that is requiring fewer letters to write down than the string itself. So an object or a pattern is random if the shortest possible description is the object itself. Another way of expressing this is to say that something is random if it is com incompressible. This idea forms the basis for the theory of algorithmic complexity. Well, I think it's better to end there. It's getting too complex, I would say. There is no algorithm for this, I'm afraid. Say so thank you very much and wish you a very pleasant afternoon. Bye-bye.